Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're ready to start. Uh, my name is Jag Huma, and I'm going to be your host this uh, evening. I'd like to invite uh, the chairman of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, Professor Paul Vengil, to welcome you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, I'd like to uh, welcome you to the campus here at Carleton. Uh, the John and Jillian Lecture Series is kind of the highlight of our academic year in the department. Uh, it's great to have a, a great turnout, but it's a great recognition of uh, contributions made by John to the department uh, as chair and as a faculty member in the department. Uh, it also gives us an opportunity to uh, congratulate some of our students who have received both awards here at Carleton and international awards. And this year is a particularly exciting year for our department. Uh, we rolled out a new program, so not only do we have a, a program now in civil engineering and environmental engineering, but we also have a program in architectural conservation and sustainability. And it just started this uh, September where we had 35 students come on campus for the program. Uh, it covers everything from historic site or historic site restoration and documentation through to the retrofit of existing buildings like a, a convent into retail space or condos through to new building design, green building design, looking at energy efficient buildings. And that program is quite successful. We had 150 applicants for a limited number of positions. And this year, the applicant pool is even stronger yet. So uh, it's an exciting time in the department. Our civil engineering program is very, very strong. Um, our environmental program is strong. And the new program is uh, off to a very good start. So it is a very exciting time in the department. And it's an exciting time tonight to have this uh, lecture. So again, I'd like to welcome you. I'd also like to welcome Mrs. Uh, Jalian for coming and her family. Uh, I'd also like to take a moment to introduce uh, Carleton's president, Dr. Roseanne Runte, and thank her for attending this lecture as well. So again, welcome, and I hope you enjoy the talk. I know it will be a great uh, talk. I was, uh, I'm now chair of the department, but when I graduated from uh, Waterloo with my undergraduate degree, we have a big picture with all of our, the graduates on there, and lo and behold, a picture of Ralph Haas is there as the chair of the Department of Civil Engineering at the time. So I'm sure he will be uh, an excellent speaker. So thank you. and. Uh, enjoy the talk. Mrs. Elizabeth Adjelian, Dr. Ralph Haas, uh, President Rante, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being present this evening as we celebrate the legacy of uh, John Adjelian. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, joining the department at the same time he came in, in 1975, and we worked together for a long time after that. I also was associated with his consulting company, which he ran. So I have these personal experiences that I wanted to share with you. As I said earlier, this lecture series is one of our way of celebrating the legacy of Dr. John Adjalian. I had the privilege of knowing him and working with him from 75 until he passed away in 2004. Uh, it is therefore inevitable that what I say is influenced by my personal impressions. John was that rare person who combined the qualities of intellect, creativity, leadership, humility, compassion, and kindness. He touched the hearts and minds of many, and of those who knew him, and were, we were blessed in many ways. John was born of Armenian parents in Worcester, Massachusetts, and after serving in the US Army, he enrolled at McGill University, where he earned a bachelor's degree in civil engineering in 1952. From McGill, he went on a scholarship to MIT, where he received an MASc in structural engineering in 1955. Soon afterwards, he returned to Canada and set up a structural consulting firm in Ottawa. His firm quickly established a reputation in the city and outside. Over the years, it has provided structural consultancy for a large number of diverse structures, some of which have been, become recognized as outstanding examples of architectural and structural innovation. And they include the Fathers of Confederation Building in Charlottetown, the National Arts Center and the Aviation Museums of Ottawa, and the Sky Dome with its new names. John joined the then Department of Civil Engineering at Carleton University in 1975, along with three of us, Patrick, Salva Durai, Juan Salinas, and myself. And I think all of us, um, all three of us are here in the audience. I think Juan was supposed to be here, and he will be joining us. Patrick is here 
from McGill University now. Um, we were fondly referred as the Gang of Four. He served as the chair of the department from 1976 until 1982 when he took retirement and was appointed emeritus professor. During his tenure as chair, he established the department as a center of excellence in teaching and research in the field of engineering. And the department has grown since then. John was an exemplary teacher who inspired his students and instilled in them his values and his vision, exposing them to real world problems. He encouraged teamwork that brought engineers and architects together. In fact, he was that rare engineer who was admired and loved by the community of architects. Of the many honors he received, John was proudest of his honorary membership in the Ontario Association of Architects. There was much to admire in John's personality. What impressed me most was his human qualities, his humility, and his compassionate nature. John's company, by comparison, was a medium size with perhaps 30 or 40 engineers at the time. But the amount of work they did was phenomenal, a testament to the quality of expertise and leadership. It was uh, so surprising in so fine a gentleman that leadership came effortlessly to him, though. He always acknowledged the achievements of people working under him, and his kindness allowed him to carry people along. John was a double A personality and always on the move, but never cost him anything in terms of wit. His sense of humor, and particularly his self-deprecating humor, was always a source of joy and laughter. And I tell this story all the time. He was given an emerit emeritus professorship uh, on retirement and said, well, I'm an unmeritorious professor now. Or when he gave, they gave him an honorary doctorate degree uh, in Nova Scotia, he says, this is doctorate without cause. <laughs> John was proud of his Armenian roots. Along, his, along with his wife, Elizabeth, he participated in founding the Armenian Cultural Association in Ottawa, whose first meeting was held in their home. He managed the renovation of the Armenian embassy in Ottawa, and he visited Armenia and frequently read the historic atlas of Armenia and collected books and maps related to Armenia. He spoke with great admiration about medieval Armenian architects and considered them to be ingenious structural engineers as well as architects. Let me take a few moments to highlight what John's work has meant for Carlton, though. As I mentioned earlier, the firm that John founded has designed a large number of structures, many of them of outstanding creativity. You may not, however, know that the majority of buildings on the Carlton campus have been designed by John's firm. They were the designers of the Tory building, the first building to be built at the new campus. And then, since then, John's firm has designed many more, uh, including the Loeb, the Southam Hall, the Library, the Peterson Hall, the Davidson Dunton Tower, the Robertson Hall, where we are sitting, the Stacey Building, the Minto Case Building, and several others. Carlton held a special place in John's heart, and he supported it in many different ways. He set up an endowment fund that will in perpetuity recognize excellence in research and education by supporting outstanding graduate students. The John Adjalian Lecture has been established to celebrate the standard of excellence exemplified by John. It is our way of celebrating the professional achievements of John as well as his human quality of honesty, integrity, humility, and compassion. It is our great privilege that to celebrate this occasion with us by presenting the 2012 lecture is one of Canada's most distinguished engineers, Dr. Ralph Haas, who will be formally introduced later on. I'm also delighted to see the Adjalian family here with Mrs. Elizabeth Adjalian and Michael and David and Paul and Hasmik um, here. And um, they were always, uh, they are always a joy to meet. In fact, there is a story around uh, where it says that, that John took the youngest one, Paul, to his office one day. And uh, when he came back, he said, but dad, you said, you work with jokers, and I didn't find any. <laughs> uh, let me invite uh, Professor uh, Halim to come to the podium and introduce uh, our speaker for today. Welcome to John Algerian's uh, lecture, and I'm very pleased to see uh, many faces. I love to see them, as well as new ones. 
I given the task of presenting uh, a colleague who meant a lot to me. He's my mentor and my former supervisor, Professor Ralph Haas. Professor Haas uh, was born in Alberta, and uh, he graduated from the University of Alberta in 1961 with a bachelor with distinction, after which he finished his master in the University of Alberta in 1963. And he was telling me that he came to Carleton, but I leave that to him. He finished his PhD in the University of Waterloo in 1968, and he became, since then, resident of Waterloo. Uh, Professor Ralph Haas today is a uh, normal uh, McLeod chair, as well as a uh, distinguished research and emeritus professor at the University of Waterloo. He has uh, three most distinguished uh, awards any Canadian will uh, love to have. The first one is uh, Order of Canada, which is the highest civilized award in Canada. The second one is Fellow Royal Society of Canada, which is the highest academic or scientific honor in Canada. And the third one is a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Engineering, which again is the highest engineering award in Canada. So between the three of them, Ralph has represent a symbol for Canadian citizens as well as professionals. Ralph was driving his cars some time ago, <laughs> stuck in the mud. I wouldn't say when, but you can predict. So he decided to start his life in the field of pavement, and you can see how automated those machines were, one horse power. Then he decided to do the business himself, but he realized at the time that he has to push the truck rather than driving it. If you notice, it has a flat tire. Then he decided to start a long trip from the north, and you can see how powerful he is and how brave in the snow with short shirts. Then he went south. All of this he was trying to find out roads that are paved the way he want to see. Then he decided to go to Japan with one of his best friends from Texas, Professor Ron Hudson, and he took a course with a samurai. <laughs> then he decided to meet some of the best and the most famous uh, pavement engineers in the world, uh, Ron Hudson in Texas, uh, Bo Lilia Lui, he's in Swedish, Ralf Haas. You can see he never changed, it's just a few white hair and that's it. And Carl Monesmith, who had his uh, honorable PhD from here, Carlton, a few years ago. And between the four of them, the field of pavement became the science that Carlton became famous in. Then uh, one of the memorial pictures is Ralph Haas with the late Bill Fang, who is the father of Ontario roads. If you drive in Ontario, and Ontario is only second to the roads in California, it's because of these two people. Then he started really the road. He wrote books with ministers, with colleagues, and they started making money until he saw me. And uh, him and me started inventing machines. Then he became rich, and he decided to teach me self-defense. <laughs> and Ralph is not only a professor, and not a supervisor, but he's a human in here. He went out with my wife and my family, Amir, Karim, Tari, and Vanessa. And uh, this photo was taken in 1992 at uh, NRC sites where we were testing some of our equipment. Uh, Jack was in the photo also, but he decided at that time he was scared of the bear. Remember that bear? So Jack decided to be aside. And with this, Ralph became rich. <laughs> you remember that photo I showed you in the early? That's before he met me. After he met me, he wore shorts and Mercedes. Then he was awarded the highest uh, certificate a human being can obtain. It's the Order of Arctic Adventurers. I showed you the photos in the beginning. And then Ralph Horst was very famous for marathons. In this one, he finished the only runner. As you can see, there is no other runners. <laughs> and he told me, yeah, no, the first and the last. Nobody else compete with him. 
100 kilometer. And with this, Ralph will start another uh, famous mileage for him. I would like you to welcome Ralph Haas. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I, uh, I guess one thing I have to do is straighten out some of the fairy tale that uh, you just heard here. Uh, that last picture you saw, I was last, I think. Uh, can't remember, but uh, certainly I'm incredibly pleased to be here and um, at Carleton again after many years. And I'm especially pleased that uh, this is in honor of John Ajalian, who in fact I knew. I had the fortune of knowing him. Um, I want to say thanks to the organizers of this uh, uh, lecture. Uh, and um, I, at the risk of not including some people, obviously, uh, uh, Halim, um, Jack Kumar, um, Paul Van Giel, uh, Kay Castleman, and others. And I apologize for those I, I missed. Um, Certainly, it's, it's just great to see the Ajalian family here, uh, and uh, that's, that's something. Uh, but if you don't mind, I'd like to just tell you why I see. It's been a long time since they invited me back to Carleton. I originally came here when John Ruptash was the Dean of Engineering, and Davidson Dutton, who you see in the picture there, was our president at that time. And the, uh, the occasion was, uh, I was a graduate student at the University of Alberta, I got a call on a Sunday morning, and uh, some of you who remember John Ruptash, my call was at 7 a.m. in Alberta. Uh, I'm sorry, at 9 a.m. John was at work at 7 a.m. on a Sunday morning here, and he said, I, I hear you're looking for a job, and I said, yes, I am. And so he said, well, I'm offering you one. I said, well, thank you very much. I was a little taken aback, and uh, then he said, uh, I said, can I think about it? He said, yeah, call me back tomorrow morning. So a few weeks later, I arrived here with a, uh, a wife and two little kids in a 1952 Chevy, which the only one in existence I think left is Dr. Don McLeod at the back has one, and I, I, he won't sell it to me. But it, it, was a, uh, it was a great adventure. We came to Ottawa, uh, and it was, um, uh, it was a, um, we had our total faculty of engineering. I'm supposed to be lecturing about roads, right? But our faculty of engineering was 12 people, 12 people, the whole faculty of engineering. And I remember when uh, we were three young guys that started here, and uh, we were invited to, I, uh, uh, President Runty is here, but I, I'm not putting you on the spot, I hope, by saying this. The president, Davidson Dutton, invited us, young three, and of course the entire faculty at Carleton. Not just engineering, because there weren't very many of us at that time. So I, then I think he, uh, we made a, a big, uh, uh, sort of a lot of his, uh, his uh, inventory evaporated that night. Uh, so that was, a, uh, that was good. So anyway, I had come from Alberta. It was great to be here. Um, uh, I, owed, uh, I, I owe a great debt to uh, the late John Ruptash, who was tremendous with those three young people at that time of us who uh, didn't, <laughs> were real rookies, but it was great and it's been a long uh, and pleasant career since then. What I'd like to talk to you a little bit about is uh, a little bit of background on Canada's roads and then a little bit about how we manage these roads in terms of the evolution, uh, the levels of management, um, the framework, um, the key issues and challenges that we face, what we uh, try to indicate for performance on them, how do we value these assets, um, the, and life cycle analysis and how we advance the life cycle analysis, and finally, innovation, sustainable practices, and I'm gonna talk green roads. We paint them green. <laughs> well, somebody told me the other day, but I still drive them, they're still black. Well, anyway, we'll see what happens on that. That looks like a lot of words, and I'll try to uh, uh, make sure they don't uh, pull me off. But anyway, um, this is a, of course, we re realize the magnitude of this country. We have about a million kilometers of roads uh, for a very small population. I was in China not too long ago. <laughs> this whole population could fit into, uh, uh, I think, Chongqing. Uh, and uh, the, uh, we are a very unique country in the sense that uh, about only 2.5% of our roads are federal administered, primarily parks and uh, military facilities. And 97.5% uh, are provincial or, and municipal or territorial, I should have put in there. And this is a uh, very unique compared to our great neighbor to the south and to many other countries where the federal presence 
is, uh, is much more um, in, in a larger sense in terms of the uh, number of roads. So uh, we also have quite a, uh, we have climatic regions and uh, what you'll see, um, Dr. Don McLeod at the back and I and um, Dr. Lynn Cowie Falls at the University of Calgary decided we'd split this country up into climatic regions a few years ago and uh, this is what you see and uh, Don, I think we're going to have to move those boundaries a little bit now that uh, uh, things are, now that we're growing palm trees up and, and oranges here in, in Ontario. But we tried to uh, tie engineering um, principles to some of the, this great diversity of climate and climatic zones and, and uh, geography and so on. So um, we have a, quite a, a well-developed road technology in this country, but it's um, been developed in response to this varying climate that I mentioned, uh, different traffic and materials. And one of the questions that we always face in this country and, and others, is this experience transferable? Can we uh, put this in other, do it in other places? Well, we are undergoing substantive climatic or climate change, and so what are the impacts? Well, one of the problems we face is that not everything occurs in isolation. These things occur in combination with other factors. So how do we predict road performance? This is a big, big issue that faces those of us who are uh, work in this field, and uh, uh, certainly. And how do we separate real climate change from high variances in, in rainfall, summer and winter temperatures, which we've seen even just weeks ago, a big change here, flooding and so on, and what is the payoff from better, more adaptive technologies? And we do have a special case of bridges because uh, when bridges are designed, and we have experts on bridges in this room, so I better be careful. When you design them, you do a site investigation, you do hydrological studies, you try to design the foundations and the superstructure, you carry out a risk analysis, um, and we try to identify the impacts of climate change. But that's fine at the design stage, but you have a lot of existing bridges um, uh, which undergo periodic inspections, um, repairs or replacement, shoreline protection and so on. And so this has become for the bridge community a, a big, big issue, uh, particularly in some of the northern parts of the country. So um, with that, I'd like to also show you, this is, I, believe me, I'm not going to show you too many slides that are undecipherable, but what I wanted to point out in this, the issue facing road engineers is that you tr what we, like anything else, you try to look into the future. What you're predicting in that green stuff in the middle says is kind of a schematic of the deterioration or performance of roads over some life cycle. Well, there are environmental factors, as you can see in the far top left. There are structural factors. There are construction factors, as you see, maintenance factors, and traffic factors, among others. And these also have a lot of individual components to them. So if you saw this as a, um, you know, as a, as a technical problem, it's massive. Uh, and then there's all, we ran dotted lines across because none of these things work in isolation. They all have a, um, they, they, and there's varying degrees of combination. So this keeps road engineers real busy trying to predict uh, for various of uh, these structural conditions or environmental conditions and so on, what is going to happen? Because as we'll see in a few minutes, the um, one of the big things is you have to try and work out the life cycle economics of what's going on. And unless you have a handle on these type of things, you're going to have a, a real challenge. There's an evolution of what we're doing. And um, in the 1970s, we concentrated very heavily on, uh, you saw a picture of the uh, textbooks that Professor Halim showed you and, and the, uh, the guides. Pavement management, uh, we decided, you know, we were looking at what people were doing in the management area. Could we apply this to pavements? In the 1980s, there was an evolution of the bridge area. 1990s, the, a more broadly based asset management. And the question is why? And one of the whys is that uh, there was a, a thought that we could apply private sector business principles for managing public assets. But there is a caveat here. The private sector has to have a profit motive, and the public sector has many objectives and demands. So the adjustments are not simple or straightforward. And of course, the, uh, the, the uh, naysayers have told me that the reasons you guys got into the management area originally is because your stuff deteriorated faster than our stuff. So uh, we were, uh, that was just an unfair cheap shot. But in some ways, <laughs> they had a point. So life cycle, um, if you look at what agencies do to manage uh, road assets and many other um, things, there is a, a broadly based strategic level, uh, and I'll try to uh, 
explain that very briefly. There is the actual, the network or system-wide level, and the same applies to networks of pipes and sewers and water and everything else. And then there's the site-specific or the project level. Uh, and this probably is, is a pretty good way to, uh, I think, characterize uh, uh, the way you know, operationally and you know, right from uh, the strategic level, the, w the way things are, are actually what goes on in agencies. Engineers like to draw boxes around things, flow charts and boxes. And I, uh, uh, road authorities have a business plan, or they should have one. But the, uh, there's a, what I want to show here is that there, um, at these various these levels I just mentioned, there's a lot of component activities uh, that range from technical to economic and so on, and uh, that um, you, could, you can read textbooks and, and uh, read these, but it's important that we understand these component activities, and it's important that we understand all the, uh, the stakeholder group interests and everything else that have an influence on what we do. There's another thing that's important, particularly when you're trying to tie roads and water and sewer and bridges and buildings and everything together, and that's a very fancy word, an integration platform. It's a nice word for saying tying things together. And let me just explain that for a moment. You know, everybody talks about a corporate database. Well, there are databases and so on, and executive information systems. But basically, the integration platform means that you, um, you have to know where things are, and geographic information systems uh, provide the mechanism for that. We should know what the assets are worth, we should know what the level of service is provided to the users of the assets, the roads, and we should have a handle on the risk exposure. So that's basically what we're talking about uh, as an integration platform, to really tying things together so that we can uh, have a, a broader, better asset. Now what I'm going to do is I'd like to just illustrate a few of the key issues and challenges that we face. Uh, and I've subdivided them into uh, institutional and policy related as the first category, and financing obviously is always an issue. Uh, there's an issue between the infrastructure that we've built, we've already built, and the needs for expansion, new infrastructure, P3s or public-private partnerships versus whether we operate things within the institution, uh, preservation or preventive maintenance policies, and knowledge management, which is a uh, and I'll try to explain that in just a moment and give you an example. The two stars are just what I'm going to, I'm not going to try and uh, uh, elaborate on all of those, but the two stars, first of all, the, the P3s, the public-private partnerships are, are something um, that we uh, probably have started to see very extensively in Canada and many countries around the world, and not just in roads, but in other areas too. Uh, so. Uh, I personally have had the opportunity to work in many different countries, including Australia and New Zealand and others on this. And one thing I found is that there are numerous examples uh, of, um, and the variations in this from, um, you know, from transportation to water and wastewater and so on. Uh, there are a lot of variations. There are some success stories, some great success stories. There are some disasters, which I think to be, all you could say is they're disasters. They're not simple to put together. Um, they're, um, they're uh, like I said, they're financing issues, there are technical issues, there are long-term, you know, there, there are just these things. Well, we have a good example in uh, the great 407 that all of you have paid your tolls on, and you know that that is a 99-year concession. The good news is there's only 89 years left. <laughs> so, but, they're, they're, they, they, these are complex, so they have to be put together properly. Now, the knowledge management and succession planning, normally uh, the thought is that this involves people. Well, of course it does, but it also involves technology. There's a succession of technology that, uh, you know, if you're old enough, <laughs> you really have seen succession of technology. And then data and information have a succession to them too. And uh, of course, we, some of us, when you're old enough, you remember filing cabinets and stockpiles, and I see guys like Mike Yercher here, and so on, we, we remember that. Some of us still practice that, don't we? <laughs> and uh, then we had computers, and, and I'm sorry, I should have put USB sticks here, rather than, rather than, than CDs, but uh, this is a, this is really, it, it's incredibly important, and I've had the opportunity to work quite a bit in knowledge management, and uh, didn't realize until I got into it that it really is a very interesting and very challenging area. The second category is the, there's a combination of institutional with technical and economic. So 
Security is something that's become very relevant to us. There is a, an issue of a sustainable policy for research and development. And developing a risk exposure procedure applicable to all infrastructure, uh, we see. And there, you could add others to that. But there's um, just uh, the third area is if sort of a combined technical and economic where um, we struggle to get objective, measurable performance indicators, an appropriate asset valuation methodology, a generically based life cycle cost analysis procedure, and a generic level of service. Uh, and what I'd like to do is very briefly just mention the, uh, the measurable performance indicators. That uh, is something that is particularly important when you're going to the public-private partnerships. You have to be able to measure things so that you can uh, uh, you know, put your performance requirements on it. Just to give you an example, uh, if we usually these should be tied to policy objectives. Well, if you think of quality of service to users, uh, smoothness of the roads is important, annual user costs, provision of mobility, and so on, and the actual uh, implementation targets where uh, there are actual, um, these are just some of the technical measures, examples that have been applied. Safety goals are usually in terms of accident reductions, um, and preservation of investment is, uh, is a critical issue. Uh, and so part of the, one of the ways we measure that is by the actual asset value of the roads themselves. So that brings me to the next thing, is the valuation of assets. Sounds pretty simple. When you sell your house, you, you have a pretty good idea. It's based on a, uh, right down at the bottom here, market value. Generally, in, in the engineering sense, uh, replacement cost is, is a very, is something that I think we, we do and people can understand. Written down replacement cost, which is a, uh, a you know, measure of how the thing is deteriorated, um, which is very popular in the road sector too. And there's a couple of others that are, um, that are in the literature for economics. So this all sounds pretty simple. And um, a few years ago, just to give you an example, well, how do you actually do this? In the United States, uh, a few years before us, uh, there was a the Government Accounting and Standards Board, Statement 34 came out, which had a very profound effect all through the United States for public agencies, and it had a big effect, spillover effect into Canada. And so there were several ways of actually doing this and using this Statement 34 to put a value on the assets. Quite frankly, um, this was not a big issue up until a number of years ago, but there's a demand by the public and by administrators to say, look at what are these things worth? And that's a very valuable, I mean, a very valid demand because we, we own these things, after all, as tax taxpayers and citizens. Then in Canada, we had something called the Public Sector Accounting uh, Board. They have a, a reporting model for tangible assets, and that came out in 2009. For those of you who are in the municipal sector particularly, this is a very uh, important uh, process that you go through. And uh, I, if you'll permit me, I was going to say that this, most of these have been written by uh, another profession uh, than engineering. So, but the engineers are really have the, uh, very largely in municipalities particularly and in, other, and in provincial agencies, are the people that have to actually do the calculations and, and uh, we have, uh, there are some major issues uh, personally, and I don't want to show any biases here on my part. Uh, I, I won't mention that this is because of the accountants. Probably I'm going to get thrown out of this room by any accountants in here. But, but it's actually, it's, uh, there, it, you know, the accounting world has to have rigor, uh, rigor and standards too, so I, that's an unfair. Anyway, what we did is we thought this was a very simple issue. And back 10 years ago, or probably now almost 12 years ago, we did a study for the Transportation Association of Canada on reporting highway asset value. And uh, my colleague at the time, this is just the red thing that you see here, is her PhD thesis. She was actually in the consulting world at that time. We found out this was not a simple problem. We found out, it, and even, so Lynn Cowie Falls, who actually is a graduate from Carleton University uh, back a number of years ago. Uh, and. Uh, she is now an associate dean at the University of Calgary in engineering. So she, uh, we found and, uh, that this was worthy of doing a PhD thesis on. So that was a, uh, so that, um, so the value, the lessons learned from this uh, are that there's a wide variation can exist for different methods uh, and different asset classes. In other words, you cannot just generalize that, um, you know, from roads to water and sewer and so on, it, it's, uh, it's a very, 
complex issue. This United States GASB 34 has major limitations, especially for long life assets because uh, historical costs are difficult to determine. Good long term data is essential um, and consistency in the application and tracking with time are needed because I think if you're Joe Public or an engineer or an accountant or anything else, it's important that you know what's happening with that asset over time in terms of the change in value. Let's turn to life cycle analysis, and this is, uh, I hope this isn't where the eyes glaze over. What we require when to do a comprehensive or a proper life cycle analysis, we should be able to have, remember I showed you that performance uh, thing? We need to have a LOS means level of service versus age. We have assets, one of the key things is to provide a level of service to the users and the owners, uh, the public. We have to do the cash flow calculations, and quite often in my field it's present worth based. We should do an asset value versus age calculation, which I just mentioned, and we should carry out a risk analysis. And one of the issues is, what about a life cycle period? How long in the future should we go? The purpose of the conventional life cycle analysis is to compare alternatives that compete for limited funds over a life cycle period using principles of economics. That's what you find, that's easy. What, so what we basically want to identify is what we should do, where we should do it, and when for the best value on expenditures. And this is a caveat. Any life cycle analysis is for decision support. It's not the decision itself. We appoint administrators and we appoint and, and we elect the, the, um, political, at the political level the people who are ultimately responsible. And we as, uh, sometimes, and, and this uh, is an issue that uh, I remember when I first, and I hate to recount personal experience, but being told very emphatically, computers don't make decisions, we make the decisions. So, okay, you're right. Uh, you know, we can, we can advise and we, and we have to remember that. Um, and uh, there are, me there are uh, methods, again, that are well documented in the literature, the benefit cost ratio, the internal rate of return, uniform annual costs, cost effectiveness, and present worth. But the real issue, and, and again, these are some, many of you in this room have been uh, taken economics courses where you've done countless examples, uh, uh, you know, and have had this inflicted on you, probably in those in engineering have had it inflicted on them in second year, if I recall primarily uh, the economics course. And, uh, but for infrastructure, including roads, the issue is which method is, uh, is best for, you know, in terms of applicability, understandability, and consistency. So um, then the next question is what uh, length of life cycle period? Well, it depends on what type of infrastructure involved. Is it a fleet of uh, buses or trucks versus roads versus buildings versus parks? And we could say bridges and other things. The reliability of the forecasts in terms of uh, what will be the usage, the, the traffic, the volumes, if it's a flow volume or, a, um, you know, or, or traffic uh, volume, the agency or departmental policy and the time after which discounted costs are negligible, depending on the discount rate that you use. I think it's incumbent on us to always look at trying to advance uh, what we do in, in management and technology and so on, through innovation, of course, through sustainable practice, and um, looking at what opportunities we can realize from that. So if we look at um, innovation, uh, this is where Professor Halim started. <laughs> the Giza Pyramid, right? Uh, and these were pretty innovative. I've been in there and I, this is a f fascinating. And then this is for Professor uh, Humar and others, uh, you know, a little more modern Cable State Bridge. Uh, and uh, then uh, you can't read the, the top right thing says, civil engineers build infrastructure on Mars. And I think for the young people in here, that's, uh, that's your challenge. So, and, and that may not be too long uh, that you're gonna be having to transport some of your stuff up there and. Uh, and so on. So, um, so the point is that innovation is essential to progress. And uh, innovation in infrastructure, um, the type of thing we deal with, there's many small steps, and sometimes there's a giant leap. Uh, somebody does discover a wheel. So this is a, but these incremental steps uh, in innovations are actually important in, in roads, particularly when you, you know, when you're old enough to look at the, um, the progress in equipment, the progress in, in processes, the progress in control, when you can have uh, precision control on, uh, for example, paving operations that are down to the millimeter, uh, earthwork, uh, everything else, 
absolutely incredible. I couldn't imagine that when I, you know, some of the stuff that we used to use back many years ago. But um, it's, it, to me, it's fascinating to watch these innovations. Um, who comes up with innovations? Well, there are creative individuals. There are, could, and I put a question mark, organizations. And uh, I know that you have an Institute for Advanced Foresight here. Oh, oh Patrick has that at McGill. <laughs> well, or there's another one. I have a similar slide, the Institute for Advanced Hindsight, too, uh, which some of us are much better at. Uh, so, and there's folk, you know, one of the big things is focus groups. Oh, we've got to constitute a focus group. And I, I think the, uh, or, you know, what are the, there's other terms for these. And I think I read that the late Steve Jobs did not believe in these, or market studies and this kind of thing. Uh, he believed that he, he knew what the market wanted and he was right. But uh, this is a popular thing to do. So uh, this is a big question. Who comes up with innovations? And, and uh, there are motivating factors. And, and this is some of the stuff that Halim and I put, started to look to a few years ago. Uh, certainly, it, there has to be a challenging problem we're dealing with. There has to be curiosity. Uh, a sense of improving practice, uh, willingness to take risk, a prospect of reward, uh, industry, it could be demand from industry or the public, and there are barriers. And everybody, uh, you know, micromanagement, another barrier, short-term outlook, um, the not, uh, you know, risk-averse, institutional inertia, limited resources, and comfortable with business as usual. So these are, uh, unfortunately, barriers that exist. So for innovation in transportation, there are a lot of, um, if, you, if you look at the driving forces, I'm not going to repeat all of those, but certainly uh, there are social and political driving forces. There are security, the, the P3 contracts, which I mentioned before. There are resources, uh, people, science and engineering, uh, economics and finance. And so all of these have, depending on you know, what technology is involved, but they all can have a, uh, you know, a very significant influence. So these are um, some of the things that we uh, try to recognize. We also, um, now I, what I'd like to, because one of the big things that come, has come up in my field is sustainability. And if you're not for sustainability, you're just nobody, right? Uh, you have to wrap yourself in the flag. But I'm, I'm kidding a little bit, but it's important, absolutely critical that we have a sense of what is sustainable in the future. And this is my translation of uh, trying to do a balance in transportation between economic and social benefits versus the need to protect, protect the environment. So what simply that means, don't do something today that screws up the future. If we look at the future, a short term, I think in much of we, what I deal with is 10 to 30 years, medium term, 30 to 70 years, and long term, maybe 70 to 100 years plus. We have to think in those terms nowadays, uh, and I think it's critical. So uh, what about the big issue of green roads. I think I told Halim and, and uh, Jack Humer a while ago that I got accosted by one of my colleagues in math the other day. He said, do you really paint them green? He says, they're still black as far as I can see. Yeah, and he's right. So, but this is a very popular term. But it's a big issue in um, transportation agencies. There's manuals and uh, codes of practice written now on green roads, um, but basically, in our field, it's a, a rating system designed to distinguish uh, high-performance, sustainable, new, or redesigned roads. And, uh, and there are many uh, sort of detailed aspects to that. And operationally, it, it, it's like lead or you know, issue or, or, uh, for buildings or anything else. It awards credits for practices that can be used to certify projects on a point value. I think that's all fine. But personally, I have an issue with it. I don't think it's enough. What we also need is a continuity of good management of the assets over the periods of time I mentioned, including the knowledge assets. We need proper succession planning of the things I mentioned a few minutes ago. And we need a continuity of sufficient resources. You can have all the recycling of materials, all the good stuff in the world today. But if you don't have these other things, uh, you're, not, you're going to lose out on sustainability. That's why I think it's, it's an incredibly important issue but uh, we need to have these things also. So what I'd like to do is uh, finish in the next minute or two with um, there's some opportunities. And this really goes back to the categories that I mentioned before. There are technical opportunities, particularly nowadays with things like longer lasting roads or other assets, better ways of predicting performance, automation, uh, uh, reliability calculations, uh, 
integration of things, long-term specifications, and there's, uh, in the publications that we do, we've tried to uh, assign a degree of risk with a lot of these things, which of course ranges from high to low uh, in uh, sort of qualitative terms, but in quantitative terms, and even the payoff from uh, doing any of these things ranges from short to long term. Then the, uh, econo the, the second category, the economic, or sort of combined economic and technical, uh, adapting to privatization, whether we like it or not, there's a lot of this right now, including the Highway 407 I mentioned, but there's so many other initiatives uh, in so many other countries, and, and we, we have to, whether we like it or not, um, and it's, it's a big issue for anything. The stability of research, dollars for high-risk ideas, um, better capabilities, incentive programs, and so on. And again, the, um, uh, the degree of risk, if you get down into the details, ranges from high to low. The expected payoff, again, ranges from high to low. And then finally, the, if you look at the institutional aspects, nowadays the, the visual interactive online stuff, nowadays the public has access, obviously, to the internet, but they're also, uh, this changes the way we do things. Uh, the public wants to know that you're going to uh, re rehab that bridge five years from now or are not going to rehab it and so on. And uh, agencies from Australia to Canada varying publish a lot of their intended programs of work, the economics, uh, and the uh, things, uh, they're available online. And this is something I could, you know, if you go through a long career, you can never comprehend initially. And I think the public right now has a right to know these things. And it's, in fact, the transparency of doing this is, is probably, for us, is a benefit because it, it forces us also as, as engineers to say that, look, we, we need to be able to justify what we're doing. And I think we can. So um, adapting um, to agencies and so on, again, the degree of risk of doing these things. And, and again, this is kind of a schematic or, or a pictorial representation varies. So the conclusion uh, that we can have is, do we do business as usual? And I think people would disagree. There's, uh, I think there's really a new, to me, there's a new culture of commitment to service delivery, to good management, preservation of value, innovation, and the safety and sustainability of our infrastructure assets. Let me have a concluding comment. I see people that are of my advanced age in this audience, and I see a lot of young people too, and I think that uh, I particularly, uh, uh, you know, you, young people have the, you look at that future, and I, I think it's a, it's a great um, opportunity to, uh, to do things that are uh, exciting uh, and, uh, and contribute to, uh, you know, fix up the things that we didn't fix up in our careers. Hi, um, I was just wondering, at the beginning of the lecture, one of the things that really caught me that you had said was, um, you know, a question that you, uh, I guess, have is whether or not um, this type of infrastructure management, this model of infra mm. infrastructure management can be applied elsewhere, so in other nations. So, um, you know, for nations that don't have, um, you know, the institutional capabilities to be able to yeah. support this type of um, method, I mean, is it, like, do you think it is possible? Because I don't really think um, I ever saw, got an answer to that, so. Yeah, there, the, um, there has to be an institutional uh, capability of doing this. I, uh, personally, I've had the opportunity to travel through a lot of different countries that have different institutional organizations, or different, uh, let's say, sophistication or advancement in their institutions, largely for history reasons, largely for economics, could be social aspects, and so on. And, and I've seen, particularly in South Africa, or in, um, Southern Africa and African countries. Uh, but it, what amazes me is how fast these organizations are adapting and, and receptive. Uh, there's almost a thirst for, um, if I could use that word, for uh, uh, trying to learn from the countries that have, um, you know, have, have had the opportunity to advance more. And I can give you, you know, in fact, uh, I, we have a, uh, recently I was speaking to, a, I was in, uh, when, uh, the McLeods and I were in Chile, there was one of our a young engineer from Namibia in South Africa. She's very, uh, she, it's amazing how much she's in charge of the road network. Uh, and she is, of course, their, or, their institutional setup is not perhaps as advanced as it could be, but they are, you know, I'm, I'm very encouraged by the, and the fact is everybody can, can, you know, can get on an internet now and, and, and contact people and ask questions and so on. And that's, that's something that, uh, I think is, is, is tremendous.
Yeah, that's it. Professor Haas, I have a uh, question about the definition of sustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, it used to be that we were concerned about how to make a trade-off between environmental effects and social and economic right. uh, benefits. The triple bottom line, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but in, in more recent times, uh, I think we have learned how to take all these variables forward, all the objectives. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of uh, life cycle analysis of roads, uh, is, is there anything that we have learned that says that environment is no longer a threat, that we need not uh, really uh, put, put a burden on the environment so as to be sustainable in every way? There was a perception, perhaps, a number of years ago that, oh, you know, these, these green freaks are going to kill us, uh, contractors, materials, suppliers, and so on. That's not the case. It, in fact, in the, as you know, the, the biggest recycling uh, material in the world is recycled asphalt. Uh, in many areas, up to 90% or more. And this makes good economic sense. So, you know, if you're a contractor that can, well, you, you know, looking at these big stockpiles of wrap, uh, it's, I think, the environmental aspect of that and the uh, cutting down, you know, uh, positioning of equipment and all the other things, if you uh, have good environmental practices, you're going to make money. And, and that, I think, is, is good. So I don't think um, uh, there is a threat on the environmental side. To me, the, the bigger threat, quite frankly, not threat, but the issue is, is the continuity of stuff, you know, because we're seeing, uh, particularly like in, in my field and others, uh, the, uh, uh, there's such a, um, the, the cohort of older people is, is bigger than the cohort of younger people that are coming in. So, yeah, I think, but it's a, it's a good question. I think that uh, uh, it's, uh, of course, it's, you know, always important as heck, but uh, I, I'm, I'm encouraged because, uh, but there's still, I, quite frankly, there still are countries where, uh, and I can mention one that Helene will know, where I asked about recycling, and I said, well, why do we want to recycle stuff? Because we're, you know, we've got all the money in the world to make new things. Uh, that's not a, I, that quite frankly disturbs me, but fortunately, they're not uh, typical. Great. Uh, Dr. Haas, uh, excellent talk as usual. Um, you know that I brought my class tonight, and yeah, uh, well, many you of the much. young people are here, and uh, I think they're terrified at uh, the amount of taxes that they're going to have to pay <laughs> to get out of the infrastructure deficit. Yeah. Uh, do you have any insights uh, to allow them to sleep tonight? Thanks, Steve. You see, and that's the danger of having a Waterloo degree. You ask those kind of questions. See? <laughs> but uh, aside from the joking, and I certainly appreciate the, the young people being here from the class, how we're going to pay for the deficit is just, well, it, it is, um, and it's growing, as we know. Uh, it is, uh, it's enormously big. Uh, taxes aren't necessarily the answer. Public-private partnerships aren't the whole answer. They're, they help in some cases. Uh, we don't, we as users, we don't like to pay extra money for anything. We don't want to pay road user fees. We don't want to pay congestion fees, which are, if you're in Singapore, it's fine. We, uh, we have trouble accepting that kind of uh, thing. So I wish I had an answer. I, I think we, there has to be, um, I think, much more of a, a, um, an awakening of the public. I don't mean to cast aspersions, and I, I see some encouraging signs. Let me give you one example. The city of Hamilton is probably one of the, and I hope, I don't know, is one of the most advanced in identifying and categorizing and um, putting performance measures on the infrastructure. And what they have done, which I think is unique, they will tell you what, the, what you own. If you have a 50-foot frontage lot, you own $31,000 worth of the city's infrastructure. And then you become conscious of saying, wow, what is that, you know, if that asset is going to start deteriorating. And I think maybe that kind of a message, you know, if somebody says, oh, it's a, Hundred billion dollars, or now our good colleague uh, Patrick's colleague side Mirza puts numbers uh, on these things of what we're up to 150 billion now, or something on infrastructure. The public has difficulty in the comprehension part of those enormous sums of money. Uh, but when you put it down to an individual basis, I think we have a little bit more of a uh, of a uh, get a handle on this thing. So that's one possible way that we can say, you know, you. Let me give you another example. I live in a condo complex, and a few years ago, the Ontario government said, look it, you guys have got to do an engineering assessment 
you got to have a, and some of you in here probably live in condos, you got to build up, well, you, you got to, but you've got to be able to finance your repairs and your uh, upgrading to that, roofs and windows and so on. And so I'm very conscious, because I live in this thing, of having to build up a reserve fund that covers things so we keep it, the condo complex in good repair. Uh, and so that's another thing. It, I think when you get it down to sort of the, the personalizing is when we get more of a, a grasp of what this deficit really is. Hi, Dr. Huss. Uh, nice presentation. Um, just a comment. It's really refreshing to hear, see that perhaps Canada is taking a, a better role in adapting new technologies, with, which is something that um, they, they lack, I guess. Yeah. Um, so my question is, what programs are being implemented right now that you know of or perhaps are being developed from the federal, provincial, or municipal uh, level that is uh, encouraging, in particular, I guess, municipalities and provincial uh, uh, government to, to implement new technologies to try to uh, at least maybe start some pilot projects and see how uh, that, that does? There are a few, um, unfortunately not many, but there are a few that, uh, you know, let's look at the bright side. Um, for example, the uh, Ontario Ministry of Transportation, as some of you know, has what's called a HIFA fund, uh, which funds, you know, ideas like uh, our, our advancements. Uh, the uh, federal government had a, uh, we started an initiative a few years ago, uh, of, and, and this is really relates to this, uh, to the sustainability of uh, practice and, and, uh, and everything else so with the, it was a, it was a partnership with NRC, uh, and uh, there was a $25 million to uh, call the, um, these were infrastructure guides that were developed. Uh, it, it, the, uh, and there's some great guides, and, and again, uh, uh, Patrick's colleague, Said Mirza, was a, uh, was a we were, he and I were on the governing council for that. Unfortunately, uh, Mike, you remember that? There were, you know, a lot of these guides were um, some really good stuff, for, particularly for the municipal sector, for, you know, um, best practice guides. Unfortunately, like a lot of these um, things, the, the, uh, the funding dried up. We still have some good documents. So uh, that's kind of a negative example, but it did make it, there was some good stuff came out of that. Other than that, uh, in the provinces, um, the municipalities are, um, well, in my own municipality, the, uh, when we got a, a large Canada Foundation for Innovation grant, my municipality uh, put in $600,000. And it's not just roads, they put it into, uh, water treatment too, and so on. So I think the municipal sector particularly uh, is, is somewhat more receptive. Well, they can move faster than provincial or federal. And I hate to say this, they're more nimble. Uh, and um, so, and there's, a lot, there's some other good initiatives. But there's, there's not a lot of, um, I, I'm struggling a bit to find you know, what the, the real good opportunities are, but uh, I think, uh, and of course, it's it's the old struggle for budgets that uh, has a as a because one of the easiest things to, uh, you know, to to cut is research, new opportunities, technology advances, because a lot of the other expenditures of governments are fixed. You can't you can't cut them without tremendous political uh, suicide. But you know, I, I know it's not a complete answer to your question, but uh, there are a few encouraging islands, but. Uh, there's a lot of Steve's class is going to, uh, going to uh, hopefully, again, you know, realize some of the opportunities in the future. Uh, thanks for the nice presentation, Ralph. I have two questions okay. for the price of one. <laughs> the first one is you give a very uh, thorough and comprehensive pictures, as usual. Uh, where is the universities roll into this picture? This number one. Mm -hmm. And do we have the, as university, do we have the graduates that can deal with this in terms of the education as well as the research? Because this is a completely different yeah. than what we have seen in, say, the last 10, 15 yeah. years. Oh, let me deal with the last one first, and maybe it's not a complete answer. We always struggle to, uh, to get graduates because they're all, when they get their uh, first, you know, when they get their bachelor's degree, they're having these enormous uh, salaries inflicted on them. Am I right? It didn't used to be that way. You know, I, I know some of the young people here would say, what salaries? But uh, seriously, it, it has an effect. We struggle to get um, graduate students that are 
interested, that uh, have the you know, capabilities, the academic background and so on. And the reality is that quite a lot of number of our graduate, our postgraduates particularly, come from other countries. We're very fortunate that we have this pool um, of people that come, and I, you know, my career has benefited enormously by having some of the most, you know, and I, I think uh, I've, I've been quoted as saying one of my legacies is to recruit people that are a lot smarter than me, uh, because that makes that certainly helps me. Um, and the other one was really on um, on how do the institutions fit into this? Well, of course, institutions are always looking for uh, opportunities. Um, there have been programs, uh, oh, that have been very uh, helpful. Uh, we have um, the Canada Foundation for Innovation. Uh, we had the Ontario, the ORF, the Ontario Research Fund, which unfortunately was just cancelled weeks ago. Um, there are a lot of initiatives on uh, because Ontario, <laughs> those of us who live here, is facing a huge budget crunch. Um, but there are, um, the universities have, I think, have been pretty good at connecting to, um, you know, to these, you know, to, I mentioned some of these publicly funded ones, but there's some uh, privately funded, uh, of course it varies a lot from province to province, and uh, I'm a native Albertan, I come from Alberta, I graduated from Alberta, they, uh, my perception is they're rolling in wealth, but their perception is they're being, <laughs> they're starving, to, you know, so a lot of it is perception too. But it's not, it, it's hard work, you have to, um, to recruit, um, and to connect and so on uh, is, is a matter of hard work and having, you know, having a message to get across. When you look at the transportation system and you look at a service life and mm -hmm. you talked about that in your talk, and then you look at your long-term vision being mm -hmm. 70 to 100 years, yeah. how much uncertainty is there in that trying to judge what's going to happen in the long term given that technology yeah. is advancing? Yeah. I mean, we've, we've survived a long time on, on yeah. roads and gasoline-powered vehicles, but I'm not sure whether in 70 to 100 years we'll still be driving gasoline-powered vehicles and using the road. Yeah, uh, <laughs> well, Paul actually brings me, I'm not trying to flog one of the studies we did, but we tried to subdivide uh, civil engineering prospects in the future uh, into the reasonably certain, uncertain, and highly uncertain. Uh, and particularly, you know, if you look at up to 100 years, I think we're still going to want to drink clean water. So that could be probably a fairly high degree. Uh, in 100 years, are we going to have a teleportation? Uh, that was probably pretty highly uncertain. So we tried to do some uh, um, sort of certain degrees of uncertainty. Uh, and uh, it, it's kind of fascinating because I think from a civil engineering viewpoint, uh, when you look at yeah, water, I think we're going we to we're gonna need to dispose of waste, uh, I think, for the foreseeable future. But some of the, uh, the other... Uh, Things, uh, transportation, uh, there's, I think there's going to be a social dimension to that. People are still going to meet and so on, even though that is going to change. I think we're still going to want those, unless we start growing those oranges here in Ontario, we're still going to want them trucked up from Florida. Um, and uh, just let me finish with, the, I, 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 could, I, I wish I could talk for hours on that, but let me finish with one. I mentioned the, uh, this Carlton grad, Lynn Cowie Falls, who is the associate dean in Calgary, she put forward an expression uh, not too long ago. You remember the uh, American Express ad, don't leave home without it? And she publicized this, transportation, you can't leave home without it. <laughs> and that really, <laughs> it resonated in Calgary. And this is Lynn, she's very creative. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it is a, um, you know, the uncertainty obviously, but some of the things, we do want that bridge to last more than 75 years, a particular major facility bridge. Uh, but we're seeing, and you know, you know, in your field, uh, some of the infrastructure we're really going to be facing problems with a lot of the underground stuff. Um, we're going to be um, in the transportation sector. We're always faced with getting increased productivity out of the trucking sector, and uh, that has enormous economic potential impacts. Materials, as you know, we're you know we're having uh, some major issues in um, in some of the urban centers. Uh, this is where recycling makes good economic sense because we're finding, you know, the distance to find good, I mean, yeah, we can go hundreds of kilometers away and find some good aggregates and so on, but uh, at what cost? So, um, I, 
course, there's high degrees of uncertainty with a lot of this stuff, but I think it's important for us as engineers to try and at least, you know, I wish I could be around long enough to see whether I'm right on some of the stuff, but uh, just to kind of uh, set some, not necessarily direction, but set some, at least a perception of what we might be facing. So that's for all these, Steve's class here and all the other young people. <laughs> it's like nothing like passing the buck to, <laughs> to the younger crowd. I have uh, seen a few pieces of literature that indicates that some funding agencies, aid agencies in, uh, in Asia are encouraging developing countries to spend as little as is possible in durability uh, so that they can show that they have built many kilometers of roads. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, the countries will have to pay for high maintenance and so on. Yeah. Is there anything out there that says something about life cycle analysis applicable anywhere, everywhere, or no? Yeah, there's a lot of stuff available, but as you know, out of the, it's, a, it's this, always this dilemma of if we spread the jam thinner, uh, we put it, we can cover more bread. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's certainly a temptation. There's a political uh, temptation, and sometimes uh, the economics to me don't make, generally don't make good sense. I've been in a lot of developing countries where I just shudder at the financial liability they're building in, not in the long term, but in the short term because the stuff is going to fall apart in 10 years. Uh, and that is kind of a try, but I, I'm surprised that I would think that, for example, the World Bank, which I've worked a lot with, um, who relies on pretty rigorous internal rate of return analysis, uh, I, I would think that many places, at least if you do a rigorous analysis, the economics should not make sense uh, on you know, spreading the jam thinner, but getting, you know, certainly, you know, I, to say this, but if you're, uh, if you've been elected and, and this gets you more votes or something, um, that's maybe being, not being fair to the elected sector. But uh, actually, that did exist to a good degree in our country many, many years ago. We were, you know, getting out of the dirt and out of the gravel, uh, but you covered lots of roads with surfaces that thick. Uh, but it made, <laughs> it was good for your re-election. <laughs> oh, Mike has a question. Oh, yeah. Sure. Um, uh, Ralph, when I was in, in the Maritimes in New Brunswick, um, one of the issues I raised with the provincial uh, transportation department, which you rightly point out, look after all the roads. Yeah. They seem to have this focus on roads and very little else in transportation. Mm -hmm. um, we were involved with the railway abandonment, mm -hmm. line abandonment, yeah. uh, at a big time in the Maritimes, but other parts of Canada as well. Yeah. And so the railroads are saying, let's rationalize, and when we have very low usage uh, rail lines, uh, look for alternatives and, yeah. and, and cut it out. And so I suggested on several occasions um, uh, that perhaps we should be doing this with roads as well, and maybe we should be uh, looking at rural roads that have very few people on them yeah. as we're yeah. you know, abandoning farms. Uh, perhaps helping people move and then shutting down the roads. And uh, needless to say, uh, the transportation folks didn't look at me very kindly. Uh, have you had any experience with yeah. uh, ro road abandonment? Uh, not so much with road abandonment, but what you, well, of course, I come from an area of northern Alberta where, yeah, we had the rail, the train used to come into my town. Yeah. <laughs> uh, rail line abandonment, it was, a lot of it made good economic sense and, and uh, created some problems. What's actually happening with some of the roads in the uh, in their areas in the US where they're reverting back to gravel. You can't afford to maintain the road. And that's, in effect, you, it's kind of a semi-abandonment, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, because you extend the, the surface that, to follow Adam's question, you extend, and in fact, some of these were just surface treated. So, you know, with a short life of half a dozen, four or five years, uh, and uh, Saskatchewan's had some problems with that, Manitoba, and, uh, you know, nobody wants to go back to dust and gravel. Uh, that is just politically horrible. But and that's where, you know, New Brunswick is is not unique in that sense that uh, the politicians who catch holy hell yes. uh, when that you know. So, yeah, because we we want to extend. You know, we want everybody to get out of the dirt and out of the um, yep. out of the dust and this sort of thing. And I, I grew up with that too. But there's not just the construction side, it's the, it's the, the ongoing maintenance, the snow oh, plowing yes, and all course. the rest yeah. of it yeah. that costs. And so we continue yeah. to build roads yeah. and we build without, thinking, 
without thinking of perhaps taking some out of the inventory. Oh, and, we're, and we're not unique. So many countries, particularly developing countries, that haven't faced the financial liability down the, down the way, the maintenance liability. Um, it is, uh, it's awful hard to tell somebody that, no, we should uh, you know, not extend, the, the, mm -hmm. extend it over too much. Of course, we, I think even in our personal lives, we sometimes are guilty of that, too. As a token of our appreciation for your uh, talk, uh, we'd like to present you a little gift. Oh. And I'll invite uh, Professor Angil to do the honors. Well, Dr. Haas, on behalf of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, I uh, would like to thank you very much for giving us an excellent presentation uh, yeah. today. It is a, an issue that we're going to face in the years to come in terms of our, our infrastructure in general, and especially our transportation system. So as a, a, a few things as a small token of our appreciation, uh, this is a, a plaque that has on it one of the buildings that uh, John Ajalian was involved in, in right. designing and building. And it has on there noted the John Ajalian lecture, Dr. Ralph Haas, March 2012. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, appreciate that. The second one I, I am going to take out because it's, a, it's an example of technology and how things change so quickly. But I just happen to have here a, a, a nice Carlton frame that has a picture of uh, Ralph from about 15, 20 minutes ago giving his talk. Oh my gosh, how it... Wow, oh, thank you. Thank you, that's great. Wow, my lucky. This is it. But I understand that you're a, a fan of art. And so there is a, uh, a book and some other, well, it's a fairly heavy book in here, and I'll let you open that on your own, but thank you very much. Okay, well, thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.